This is the podcast for Multi-Faith Matters. I am the host, John Moorhead, and today I have two guests with me. I have Emily Cuban and Frank Kachanoff. Uh, Emily is uh, with the Department of Psychology at the University of Colbins Landau. Did I get that pronunciation correct, Emily? Colbins Landau. There we go. Uh, I should have just given it to you. And uh, <clears throat> uh, Frank is with uh, the Department of Psychology at Wilfrid Laurier University. Did I get that one correct? Yeah, Laurier. Well, for Laurier. Okay, there we go. All right. We'll have uh, their uh, links will be in the podcast notes uh, for folks who want to follow up. But we're going to be talking today about an article of theirs uh, that I found fascinating titled uh, Threat Rejection Fuels Political Dehumanization. And I'll post a, a link to that. That was published in the journal The Social Psychology and Personality Science. And I'm going to read just a portion of the abstract so folks can kind of get a feel for it before we talk about it. Um, it says, Americans disagree about many things, including what threats are most pressing. We suggest people morally condemn and dehumanize opponents when they are perceived as rejecting the existence or severity of important perceived threats. And uh, by way of background on my interest in this subject matter, I've been looking at uh, dehumanization uh, for a while now in different contexts, uh, as I see it in within, unfortunately, American evangelicalism in politics and religion. Uh, and so I'm trying to understand that. I've been doing research for a book proposal on the new Christian right, uh, looking at uh, how that group perpetuates satanic panic. It didn't end in the 1980s. It, uh, in the 1990s, it continues on. And it's shifted from seeing demonic enemies in pop culture now to seeing political liberals as somehow allied with uh, evil supernatural forces. And that can involved dehumanization. So when I read your article, I was intrigued and, and saw maybe the possibility of connecting some dots, but I, I certainly don't want to read into your research inappropriate. Let's begin to in, unpack your article. What led the both of you to, uh, to your interest in studying this topic? Yeah, well, maybe I can start and then Frank can highlight his interest, because I think this is really a collaborative effort of like combining both of our interests into one project. Um, so my interests stem primarily in focusing on how people view the political climate, the political world, and especially their political opponents. Um, and there's a lot of research out there on these ideas of like meta perceptions. So it's not about how I'm perceiving my opponents or how I'm perceiving the world, but rather what I think they think. So making inferences about what they're thinking about in terms of policy or politics or the world at large. Um, and what, there's, a lot, there's a lot of research suggesting that these kinds of, of meta perceptions have serious implications, even if they might not always be accurate. Um, and so we see that this might actually be one way that we're driving or promoting further intergroup conflict. So that's one area of my interest, but I'm also really interested in like bridging divides, like finding ways we can talk to our political opponents more effectively, finding ways not, not necessarily to change policy attitudes between opponents, but at the very least make them respect each other a little bit more, make them have a little bit better, more positive uh, evaluations of their opponents. So that's where my interests stem from. Um, and you'll see influences of that throughout the work, but a lot of it also comes from Frank. So I'll give him an opportunity to share his work. Sorry about that. I was trying to mute my phone and activated it. Um, but yeah, so my my interests um, kind of come from a different route of interest in how people perceive social identity and kind of a, that core role of that to their well-being and kind of way of moving through life. So a lot of my um, research previously studied like um, the importance of being able to express identity and culture. Um, but what goes hand in hand with that is also um, another type of threat, which are realistic threats. So um, whether or not people want to protect the physical well-being of their group, the resources of their group, and there's a rich tradition of this um, in social psychology. So a lot of work by Stefan and Stefan um, on integrated threat theory kind of really brought both of these threats in, into um, kind of people's thinking, researchers like myself, and in kind of exploring what was going on in the COVID-19 um, pandemic, I really 
we started to see in some of the earlier work that I had done um, with other folks in Kurt Gray's lab where I was working at the time kind of, we started to notice how people were experiencing both types of threat, symbolic and realistic, um, as the COVID-19 pandemic um, began. So in terms of realistic threat, that's probably more obvious. So the pandemic, getting sick with COVID-19 um, could, could result in death or, or serious illness. Um, it was a threat to our economy. So um, how is this gonna, how are we gonna kind of push through the pandemic economically? Um, so very tangible, concrete threats that you can hold in your hand. And when Pew Research or different groups started studying and how people were responding to the pandemic, they really latched on to those realistic threats to begin with. Um, and then some of our work said, well, maybe there's also a symbolic component. So if you, you know, re I remember pictures of New York just totally shut down and empty and, and kind of like these symbols of America and kind of when we think of just like what America was, you step out your door and then it's just so different. That's a very symbolic threat. Um, if you think of um, American civil liberties and, and freedom, and now you're having to do specific things for America as a whole to try to engage in public health protocol. Um, but that's kind of at odds with what you would normally just do or having total freedom over how you went about your life. There is that symbolic aspect too. And so um, our work was kind of showing how the, the pandemic hit both of those chords and, and were related in Americans um, in terms of what they were experiencing. And then um, in joining forces with Emily, again, who's really interested in these meta beliefs. Well, my work had initially said, well, how do you perceive threat? We started to say, well, maybe it's also important about what we think the other side thinks is a key threat. Um, and so we really kind, kind of combined our lines of work into this um, collaborative project. Well, I must say that I was taken by surprise with the political and religious reactions to COVID-19 and vaccines and all those debates. The more I dug into it afterwards, it, now it makes sense as to why some of those reactions were there. What was it that, that made you two say, you know what, there, there's something we need to probe about the, this COVID-19 pandemic in terms of the psychology? Well, um, as Frank was saying um, earlier, we are very interested in this idea of realistic versus symbolic threats, but often these types of threats can go hand in hand with one another, especially in the political context. So for example, I can be very concerned if I'm a pro-gun person that um, I need, I, I want to avoid harm. I want to avoid a realistic threat, for example, of an intruder coming into my home. So I really want to have a gun. But it can also be that I really want to have a gun because I have this like symbolic sacred right based on our constitution that like I have this right to ownership of guns. So like these two things can come, can work together and often do where like people can endorse both realistic and symbolic um, threat concerns, care about these things in similar ways. Um, what was interesting about the COVID-19 pandemic is that to mitigate against one of these threats, we almost had to like kind of encourage the other type of threat to be occurring. So for example, if we wanna reduce this realistic threat of like people dying, people getting very sick um, from COVID, then we're gonna have to close down and lock down. And that means that we're also encouraging this like symbolic risk of potentially happening. Um, for example, um, by, by making people feel like they've lost their way of life, their, their, their typical traditions like birthdays or going to church services or customs, all of these things we can't do anymore if we're going to have this reaction to the realistic threat of people dying. So the, the COVID-19 context kind of presented itself as a unique context for us to be studying um, a place where like these two threats are like almost in competition with one another, which isn't necessarily what typically is happening in a lot of the political debates or situations or contexts that we face uh, today in society. So that's why we chose to focus in on the COVID-19 pandemic specifically. And to uh, the other thing that, and we'll talk a bit about it in a sec, but we also just noticed, again, like you said, John, how polarizing it was getting and kind of the dehumanizing language um, that was just going on in the the debate of either people on Twitter, political leaders calling um, the other side 
you know, selfish monsters in certain cases or just so kind of um, that also kind of practically we wanted to see what what was kind of underlying um, that animosity and then seeing if, if this kind of mechanism of just thinking the other side doesn't care about something you really care about in terms of a threat to your group was was fueling that. Well, this question is the big one here, multifaceted. So feel free to take your time to unpack your response. Can you describe your hypothesis related to perceptions of harm, moral, con moral condemnation, and threat rejection? And then how does dehumanization play into that? Yeah, so there is, I guess, a lot to unpack there. Um, but basically what we're kind of proposing is that there's a lot of past research that's suggesting that when we, when people, when we uh, believe that people have committed harm, so like, for example, somebody has like punched a baby or, I don't know, done something really harmful to another person, we immediately are willing to morally condemn them. We view them as, a, as immoral, as like a bad person, right? But what we past morality research hasn't really been focusing on is if um, just not caring about a harmful act happening also has similar negative consequences. So for example, does like saying that you don't care if the baby was punched, you don't care about this like harmful event either happening or potentially happening, does that also lead to others viewing you as like a more immoral person, morally condemning you. Um, so that's kind of what we started focusing in on. And what we what we find is that clear that often when people are um, very, um, they view others as immoral people when they morally condemn their political opponents, they, they or sorry, I shouldn't say political opponents, when they just morally condemn people in the most general sense, they're also very likely to dehumanize them because humanity is often associated with this idea as like moral beings following moral codes. And when you when you don't do that, when you're not following these moral mandates or these moral codes, you're stripped of your humanity. So it, it, it feels like it, it, there's a, a likelihood that when we're morally condemned, we're also going to be dehumanized. Um, maybe Frank also would like to highlight at this point about our symmetry versus asymmetry hypotheses, or maybe, I don't know if we want to get into that yet, but I think it could be a good time to do so. Yeah, sure. So, so as Emily was saying, um, you know, harm is intimately linked to perceptions of moral con condemnation and, and moral condemnation again is morality is, is something we view as a fundamentally human um, thing which then leads to dehumanization. An interesting thing we also wanted to explore in this work is again we're talking about these two sides of the coin or kind of two types of threat, the symbolic and the realistic. And there's some work um, in, in the moral psychology space that shows that the more concrete a type of, of threat is, so again punching um, someone, uh, a vulnerable patient, it's very concrete, will really strongly moral con uh, morally condemn that where when it's a symbolic or kind of higher order thing of uh, let's say disrespecting a country's flag there's potentially perceived harm there but it it's not as easy to hold in your hand and so we wondered if in this work if if thinking that the other side doesn't care about whether americans die versus they don't care about what it means to be american are both of those um, forces going to be equally powerful and in, in leading to moral condemnation and dehumanization? Or might thinking you don't care if Americans die or you don't care about American livelihood, these concrete things, will that, because it's concrete, even strike a chord at a higher, at a higher decibel, at, in, in, at a, in a more potent way? And, and the, what was interesting is we didn't we kind of had two competing hypotheses. So in this work, it was one of the cases where we didn't have a firm position on one thinking one side was going to, or one hypothesis was going to be true because there's a lot of literature in, in our field to support both. There's a lot of work showing how powerful symbolic threats can be in fueling intergroup conflict and collective action, but there's also work really showing how these realistic threats of thinking they're going to harm us, they want to harm us, can can lead to visceral dehumanization as well. And so we kind of went through those two paths and, and trying to see would both be equally kind of drivers or, or might the realistic ones um, be more potent than the symbolic ones. And now to the, 
how did you test you know these competing hypotheses or or your, your ideas how did what was that process like yeah so first um as i think we kind of already touched on at the beginning of this interview that um, COVID is clearly a very polarizing um, topic in the U.S., especially it's become very partisan, very divisive. Um, and because it's so tied to politics and it's so polarizing, um, we wanted to test the effects in this context, have it be a real world um, situation to see if our effects are emerging in, in society today. But also as social psychologists, we want or we, we like to have multiple methods for um, testing, testing our predictions or our hypotheses. And so we also decided to look at it in a more controlled setting. So I'll talk in a moment about the COVID um, specific study, but I also wanna highlight, we focused on it, which I can also talk about more in detail um, in a more controlled setting that was fictitious, fictitious. So we created our own little like mini world quote unquote, that we shared with participants um, to test if our effects work in this less polarizing, less um, well-known type of context. Um, but I can get into that uh, in a second. So we initially tested this in a survey, um, a sur a survey study. And we asked um, participants to report their stances on COVID social distancing measures. Um, and then after that, they, they, they heard about somebody who disagreed with them on this issue. So they, the person was an opponent in terms of disagreeing on social distancing. So if I'm a pro-social distancer, I'm hearing about somebody who's anti-social distancing, and I'm responding to questions about how I think about them. Because again, we're also focusing in on these meta perceptions. What we find is that pro-social distancing people believe that the other side did not care about realistic threats, meaning that they felt like the other side, people who were anti-social distancing, didn't care about things like people's lives or livelihoods or the cost of the pandemic on these like real tangible threats. Um, and because uh, they felt this way about those people, that they, that they didn't care, they disregarded these threats, that led to greater moral condemnation and dehumanization of these individuals. What was really interesting was that we also found that the symbolic threat, so when we felt that the other side didn't care about symbolic threats, this effect wasn't there. So people weren't um, condemning to a greater degree or dehumanizing those individuals, suggesting that when we hear that the other, we believe that the other side doesn't care about um, realistic threats, threats to our lives and livelihoods, those are situations where we're more likely to condemn and dehumanize. Um, maybe I should get into the second study or Frank, do you have anything to add about this point? Um, you know, I would maybe, I would just continue. So the other thing we did before we get into kind of the make belief side is we also, you know, sticking with the COVID um, context, we also experimentally, so um, that first study was correlational. And, and another thing we really tried to do in this work was experimentally see, you know, that first study kind of showed if, if you're a pro-social distancing and you saw an ant, someone who was opposed to social distancing mandates is not caring about human lives or these realistic things, what if we could intervene and say, well, they do care about realistic threats, but maybe in, in a slightly different way um, than you do. And so um, we did another study, again, in the COVID context, which was experimental, where we told um, uh, people who are pro-social distancing in one condition, we, we just said, this person's anti-social distancing, how do you perceive them? So we, we didn't give the person any rationale they might have had. Um, in the second condition, we gave one that was very standard of what was often associated with the anti-social distancing stance was like, this is going against American freedoms, disrupting our American way of life, a very symbolic um, part of it. And then in the final kind of our focal intervention condition, we, we said, what about, um, we, we told them, here's someone who's um, anti-social distancing and they're concerned about um, threats to American values and, and disruption to their American way of life. And part of the reason is it because it's really going to be harmful to their mental health. And they're worried about people, you know, psychologically, physically struggling because of these symbolic costs. So in a way, both threats were present, showing that they are caring about um, health and these realistic things but in, in perhaps a different way than they were thinking about it in terms of 
the harm of, of the virus. And, and we found that we could reduce um, levels of, of condemnation and dehumanization when exposing a side to, to this dual threat. Like, so both concerns are present, ones that they could potentially resonate with with more. Um, so again, kind of giving this experimental evidence in, in, in this realistic context. Um, yeah, so that was one side um, of it, this COVID context. And then um, maybe Emily, can, you can share some of the, the I guess, more fictitious or, or artificial stuff we did too that's more controlled. Yeah, so our, for a more controlled setting, we got outside of this polarized context of COVID and created this little kind of story to tell participants. And we told them, imagine you're living in this community and this community is, is um, basing their views on, or sorry, is, is, um, is focused on cultivating the blue blossom, which is a special flower that is really important to the culture and traditions of the community. So this is like a symbolic thing for the community, but now, it is um, um, potentially causing some health risks. It might, it, basically we suggest that there's some evidence of it potentially either causing asthma, so like a, a, a physical health um, threat, realistic threat, or it's causing economic burden, um, an, uh, an, an economic realistic threat. Um, and then participants are given the, the opportunity to choose whether or not the, the uh, to report whether or not they think the, the flower should be um, continue to be cultivated or be banned. Um, and what we found in this case is that like people's responses were either very weakly or not at all related to their own part, uh, political ideology, suggesting our our, um, our context was really outside of the political realm. And also we had much more even splits in terms of people who were either supporting or going against um, cultivating it, suggesting that people, there's many people that really value um, symbolic threats and care about these things. Um, they care about losing things that are tied to our culture and our society. Um, and what we found is very similar effects where, where um, people who were supporting um, banning the flower either due to economic or, or um, um, health uh, threats, realistic threats, they believe the other side didn't care about these realistic threats. And when they believed that, they were also more likely to condemn and dehumanize those people, um, significantly more so than when they thought the other side didn't care about symbolic threats. So this is driving home the point that basically the places where we're most likely to condemn, morally condemn and dehumanize those that disagree with us on issues is when we think that they don't care about realistic threats that we care about. That realistic threats are really like a, a, a key driver for promoting high levels of uh, condemnation and dehumanization of those that disagree with us. What what did uh, the dehumanization look like? What, was it primarily labels, language? Uh, was there anything else beyond that? So, I believe from what um, I recall that all of our uh, all of our um, measures were related to um, Likert measures, if I'm not mistaken, Frank. Yeah, so I so I actually I just pulled up some of examples. So we were using um, a, a previously validated uh, scale of dehumanization and, and dehumanization that's actually measured. You, you could have a whole podcast on just like the different ways you can measure dehumanization. And sometimes it varies from how explicit, like blatant it is versus more subtle ways. Um, our items were fairly um, explicit. So in one item, you rated how how mechanical and cold and like a robot is is this political opponent? Um, is the opponent emotional? Like they are responsive and warm. That would be a reverse coded item because it's emotionality, warmth is something we we kind of tend to see as human. Another um, dehumanizing statement by, might be saying they're lacking self-restraint like an animal. So even explicit terms um, like animal in, in the items. So those were, were our dehumanization uh, measures. I can also give you a sense of the moral condemnation items. So that's kind of a middle part. Like in psychology, we'll also often kind of see how like one thing goes to the other, goes to the other and in a causal chain and so um condemnation were things like 
Um, they're completely immoral. They're fundamentally wrong, absolutely shameful. Those items would in turn, at least in our model, lead to, again, these, these kind of blatantly dehumanizing um, ways of characterizing your, your opponent. One of the things I appreciate about, I, I've had uh, Kurt Gray on the program and the kind of work that he's done, how you, you worked with him, is that this is, isn't just staying in the abstract. This just isn't academic work. You're interested in taking the results of this and, and trying to implement it in strategies in the real world to make a difference in people's lives. So the question is, what conclusions did you draw as to how you might make application to cultural conflict and policy formation, whether it's about COVID, the next pandemic, or whatever the next political issue might be? Yeah, well, I think one of the biggest additions that this research provides is, is explaining why we have conflict. So there's lots of evidence of other things that can cause us to have conflict with those that we disagree with. So for example, if we think the other side is a threat to us and our safety and our well-being, that they themselves are the threat. But here we're doing something different and we're instead saying, what about what I think they think? And just doing that process of like this meta perception, what I think they think, so it's not based on necessarily what they think, but that's what I think they think, just this process in and of itself can potentially be driving intergroup conflict, making things worse for people. So I think that understanding that this is at least one other way that we can be making conflict worse in our society, one other um, a line of, of or strategy that is making the, or not strategy, but it's making things worse, um, is is an important addition um, of this real um, of this research. The other thing that I think is also really key about it is that it's not just like every type of threat that's necessarily working in similar ways. So our research is suggesting, of course, in some cases, symbolic threat also can make things worse when we think the other side doesn't care about losing tradition or culture, et cetera. That can also lead in some cases to some conflict and condemnation and dehumanization, but that the real, like, um, the most present driver of this is believing the other side doesn't care about very tangible harms, things like um, um, not caring about people's lives and livelihood, that this is really a, a very intense driver of the conflict. Um, I don't know if Frank wants to say, add something more about like policy or, or cultural conflict in a more practical sense. Yeah, I can I can speak to a few things. So kind of looking at this work and again, some of our earlier research, we were asking asking people like, what threats do you see um, and, and how that relates to behavior? So one thing that might, you know, if I just asked you, do you think in the COVID-19 context, do you, would you think that my level of symbolic threat and realistic threat was positively correlated or not correlated? at all, what, what would you kind of guess, John? Would you think they're positively related or maybe there's a negative correlation or would you think maybe no correlation? What would, what would your intuition be? Oh, you're muted, John. Here we go, sorry, sorry about that. The, the host is muted. Uh, I would assume there'd be some kind of positive correlation. Yeah, exactly. So people had both threats. Um, I think in some of our work, we found correlations as high as 0.4, like 0.5. That's a pretty moderate correlation. And so it shows that, you know, even though people had would be higher on one versus mm -hmm. the other um, and kind of looking at how, you know, within people, how these things predict behavior in different ways, we had we, we experienced both threats. And I think, you know, when we get so heated up in, in issues sometimes, we might just think that another side disregards a threat. We kind of forget that we're having both threats too, that both threats are, both concerns are living inside of us. And so I think, you know, some of the intervention work we did in, in our final study and in, in this paper is, just shows the value of, of you know, when, when you frame your side, you know, kind of getting a fuller, picture of, of what's going on and, and also listening to the other side and, sh and seeing, you know, there might be more similarity than we expect. Um, that's a common theme, not just in, in, in our work. In a way, we didn't actually, in this work, we didn't really look at misperceptions and meta perceptions. So like, are people accurate about what the other side does? We didn't really 
focus on that here, but that's a growing focus of a lot of amazing work on meta perception research that's being done presently in our field that often shows people assume there's a bigger gap than there really is. And so I think these different types of interventions where we're we're trying to bring people to see more of the similarity than than the difference and and kind of closing the gaps about what we think they believe versus what they actually believe i think could can really be an important way forward and just generally in 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 understanding these um polarizing issues and, and kind of conflict we're, we're facing as as america right now well, my my last question calls from for some speculation on on your part and some opinion. Um, the way we got here was I found your article. I found it fascinating. As I mentioned at the beginning, it connected to my own interests and my own research. And I reached out to, to Emily with a question, and basically it was this: um, you know, as you know, one of the the major actors in the American COVID wars, if we can call them that, has been the new Christian right and their perception. Uh, was tied to their, not only the, the, there, there's a fusion, of course, of political and religious concerns because of Christian nationalism. And the idea was that they were opposing the COVID vaccinations, not only because of perceptions that they were, it was a loss of freedom, but also there's also this belief in a, a literal evil supernatural reality and that opposing political forces in the, in the culture are being led and, and energized to try and take away their freedoms and to, to push this on them as a form of political and religious control. Is there room in the future for connecting this kind of research to these kinds of beliefs? And, and what would the relationship be, would you think, between the symbolic and, and realistic threats in that regard? Again, you didn't do this kind of research. I'm asking for opinion and speculation so people can take it for what it's worth. I could see the yeah. wheel spinning. <laughs> I, I know. I think we're, we're we're still thinking a lot about this and how it can connect to our work. And yeah, it definitely is um, all speculation. What we say right. here, given that we don't have data on this, um, I don't know. Frank, do you have any ideas <laughs> on how? I mean, I think it's an interesting thought about how these like demonic um, conspiracy theories, like thinking that some kind of like demon or 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 dark force is, is is associated in some way with um, vaccinations and whether or not we should be vaccinated. The question is, is that realistic versus symbolic? And I don't know if I have a clear answer, but maybe Frank has some insights. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's in, in prepping for this and then that question, John, we, we might have found your next podcast, but there actually, we did, <laughs> I did, we did just this morning found one paper by Julie Xline and colleagues um, from Case Western, where they actually have data mm. um, looking at how demonic versus divine attributions of um, COVID-19 vaccines related to people's support versus opposition, both of the vaccine and those who supported the vaccine. Mm. So we kind of attributed that there are demonic forces um, behind um, either, behind people wanting to get that vaccine versus um, God was behind it, um, it really shift your support. So I, I, you know, I think this team, I just skimmed it very quickly, but it might be a right. whole interesting um, group to reach out to. But in, in terms of like symbolic realistic, I think it might depend. So it, it's, I think part of a question is, who are you asking? Are you asking me who I don't, I don't, um, identify with that group, or, or are you asking um, the Christian right? They might see it as very realistic because um, if, if they, and again, I, I'm not familiar, I'm not that religious myself, but if they see, if they truly believe in demonic forces as a real force that's acting on them and the world, it's realistic. That can cause harm. It could very well um, and bear in mind potentially um, be a realistic thing. If you ask me, I might have a different perception because I might have less of a belief in a demonic force. I might not see it as realistic. So again, totally speculative, but I think that could be, you know, in, in that work, I think who you're asking and the background can really probably shape the ways people 
are, are kind of processing these, these um, different threats. And I know Kurt, you know, has done some work on, on just harm perception and how, depending on your, you know, political or religious backgrounds, different things are or not harmful, depending on how you perceive it. And so, um, you know, again, kind of exploring, you know, who you are and, and measuring it in those ways, I think are fascinating questions, but um, unfortunately ones we don't, we don't have data on yet, but very, very- That's all right. I, I appreciate you letting me put you on the spot. I, and, and I ask because again, I have seen some dehumanizing language on the part of the new Christian right in regards to other religious traditions, drawing up metaphors of disease and warfare. And it it's just seems to me like there might be something there for those researchers who are, are inclined to, for those who do see it as a realistic threat, even though many in the academy wouldn't and would tend to want to write it off, I'm reminded of, you know, it, the re reality is in the, the eye of the beholder many times. And if we've got these major players in the culture wars that have this perception and we want to try and frame things so they can be received in the best possible way by this segment of society, it might be something that's, that's worth researching and understanding for the future. So that's why I put it on the table, but I thank you for for letting me do that. <laughs> yeah, totally. But yeah, did, is there anything else that we that uh, that I didn't ask that you wanted to to bring out about the article, or have we kind of covered the bases well enough for folks to understand? I think for on my end, everything was actually addressed. I think we okay. had a great platform to be able to share our work. So thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, totally. I I totally resonate with Emily. I really think we covered the key the key aspects of it, John. Well, great. Well, thank you so much. Again, I will put uh, the access to uh, the link to the article in there in the program notes and uh, a little bit of your bio. And I want to thank you both for being a part of the podcast. I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you.